growing up between two disparate cultures, you're trying to find some form of definition. And whether we want to do that or not, we're not entirely sure at this point. And, you know, it's the most natural human instinct. I read Iqbal's poem called A Withered Rose. And the anguish in that poem, the loss that he communicated, it just resonated with me. For me, it communicated that anguish of trying to find some way of existing between two different cultural constructs. So home is a concept that you have to decide for yourself. Hello everyone, Assalamu Alaikum. Welcome to Raw Pods, creative thought and expression hosted by Rawani. We are going to be quite conversational about it. We do have a structure to it. You know, we'll be talking about Kutsia's journey, her identity, how she derives it, and flowing on to her work, her research, what she's learned about staying authentic. We have already covered a little bit about why we need this authenticity, but we can speak a little bit more to that. It is quite conversational. Before I start asking Kutsia to tell us about herself, this is the issue of the Poetry London Spring 2023 issue, and Kutsia has been featured in it, which is a pretty big deal. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I was there at her South Bank reading last week, and it was just wonderful to see. I think there were two South Asian origin poets. Kutsia was one of them, and definitely the much younger one. So it was lovely to see somebody there, and then to hear her introduce herself as British Pakistani and to own her identity the way she did, I was like, wow. Like, I could only imagine the journey it's taken to come to where you have and to be there and just be yourself and still do such a great job of it. So well done. And tell me a little bit more about yourself. Introduce yourself to the rest of the community and introduce your work and how it all started. Well, thank you for that. That's a very nice <laughs> comment to make. But firstly, I think I would introduce myself as Kudsia. My name is Kudsia. And okay, now I'll, I'll go back to the beginning. Being a second generation immigrant in the UK, I found myself caught between two seemingly disparate cultures. And I think I felt very conflicted. I didn't know who I was, where I could find a routing, I guess. And I struggled immensely with the most seemingly simple yet crucial questions. Who am I? Where do I belong? What's my purpose? Which I think we all <laughs> experience at one point in our life. And I kept, I used to keep, well, I still do, but I think it's just shifted into poetry now. But I used to write a lot personal kind of personal diaries, expressing my worldview and thinking more about the ways in which I interact with the world. And then I think studying English literature at A level, going on to university to study English literature and creative writing, I felt this strong responsibility to communicate myself, my identity to the world. And that's very, some people might say brave, some people might say presumptive to think that I have opinions and I could share them. <laughs> but I think making that switch from wanting to study the sciences to literature and wanting to be a writer, and we know in our culture, that's, you know, what is that? <laughs> is there a career in that? What's plan B? Everybody was asking me those questions at that time in my life, and I just had to follow it through and to see where it takes me. So this series of questioning led me to write poetry and most importantly, Hamoshi, which is my debut collection of poems. And to me, identity is a series of questions. And through challenging and questioning the cultural constructs, I find that I am returning, mapping and discovering the individual. And individuality is key to my work as much as it is about the collective as well. Yes. Beautiful and very well thought out response. I'm just going back a little bit to where you said that there was a conflict in the identity. I am conscious and I am raising kids in the UK that there are differences in the two cultures and there is that disconnect. Could you point to a few things that you felt were like vastly different? And I am asking in context with your poetry and the research that you're doing now, how that's led on to that. Okay, it's a very complex question. <laughs> well, it is a common dilemma amongst British Pakistanis trying to find some rooting in the UK. And then when you do travel back to Pakistan, you sense a distant connection to it, but it's not home. Because, of course, you've experienced it either through your parents or 
your grandparents. And I think that's a direct consequence of migration. So our identity becomes adaptable. It's the ability to change face, to be able to slip into selves. And I think that plurality is important. (laughs) And in that sense, to identify is to settle into a cultural construct that in turn seeks to define you. And often I think that growing up between two disparate cultures, you're trying to find some form of definition. And whether we want to do that or not, we're not entirely sure at this point. And, you know, it's the most natural human instinct to want to settle into a community, to be a part of a a collective consciousness, a collective whole, to be a part of a larger mechanism. As a poet, I would say that I'm seeking to disrupt the fixed positions of the self, this singular cultural construct that we might encounter through stereotypes, or through racism, um, the mass media. And sometimes we come to internalize these assumptions about ourselves and we have to decolonize our own brains because we're raised with the inherent so much in that sense. Poetry felt like the perfect form to express this because as we know, poetry is suggestive. It asks questions more than it answers. And it's a place where one can think critically and question identity. I think there are shared experiences of identity, which forms that community and forms that connection. But at the same time, there is individual experience, which is why I encourage you know, we need more voices because we're not all the same, even though we share the same ethnic background. And the range of contemporary South Asian poets in the UK at the moment, to name a few, Sasha Akhtar, Sandeep Pama, Nisha Ramaya, Banu Kapil, Hafsa, Anila Bashir. These are just some names that I'm <laughs> churning out here. Each of these writers bring an individual perspective to the themes of trauma and migration the self and female experience. And each of these writers uproots the self in many ways. And that's something that I'm interested in, uprooting the selves as a form of clarity rather than searching for a fixed sense of belonging. Because I think one thing that you have to come to terms with is I don't think that there is an answer and I don't think you can belong in any place. It takes any form of conflict and you might have to migrate. So home is a concept that you have to decide for yourself. Yeah, I think that's beautifully explained. And I really like that you mentioned previously when we were talking about the concept of multiple cells and how you start to derive that. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. A couple of things that came to mind, and there were questions that I wanted to ask with regard to your experience. Even in the phone conversation that we had a couple of weeks back, I mentioned to you that I was at a screening of Jemima Khan's movie, and after that, there were a couple of people, including herself and some anthropologists, talking. And panelists included people who migrated from South Asia, as well as third generation immigrants. And everybody kind of derives their identity slightly differently, of course, there are nuances, but everybody is a British Pakistani, like nobody is entirely one or the other after a certain period of time. And it makes me think that what is it that we continue to carry of the past that remains distinctly different from the wider settings? And are we doing enough as a community? And I don't expect you to have the answers to this, but just a little bit on your experience as compared to others, for example, the Indian community and how organized they are in all areas, business and arts and everything else. Whereas even conversations that I have with foundations supporting British Pakistanis, it's quite clear that it is very difficult to get to assimilate international Pakistanis together as one unified community. So what has your experience been, whether it's in your professional journey as a writer or as an academic? I think that's interesting because here in Manchester, there is a a group called the Muslims Writers Group, I think, and they used to run a series of workshops for Muslim writers. But I, other than that, I hadn't come across at the time when I was writing a kind of a defined space where you could share work and, which is why I I think when I was working on Hemoshi, I felt quite alone (laughs) producing this work. And of course I was sharing it with my supervisor or with friends, of course, who weren't from the same background. So I think that that helped me write poetry that was quite accessible and universal so that it isn't just written for a South Asian audience. And coming across Rowani and the raw pods, I was actually quite immersed in it and impressed because had I had this, (laughs) had I known that this was around at the time, I might have a different understanding of the creative practice because 
often I find that here in the UK, I can't speak for everyone, but there is a disconnect because we're not fully aware of the Urdu literary inheritance that we might use to, and put to good use. And I think that there is a disconnect in that sense. And there needs to be more work in translation, more communities like this, where people are talking about creativity and, and how good it is for society as well. I think there's a heavy focus on STEM subjects and um, <laughs> the practical ideas of making a living and working in the world. But I think creativity is important. And, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons why we were mentioning before with children, you know, you introduce them to song, to creative play, because they need that to develop. And if you're not developing that in a society, there's going to be some side effects to that. And I think we can see some of that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Completely agree with you. And I would say that it's not very different back home in Pakistan. There is a massive linguistic divide that we're only now, I'm not even sure if we're coming to terms with it now, because what I hear about what's happening in schools nowadays, it sounds like Urdu is completely taboo. It was pretty, it was looked down upon even when we were growing up. And you only over time see how problematic that is and what a disconnect that has caused. And I know a lot of your work has focused on the partition and the pre-partition transitions as well. So it would be great to touch a little bit upon your experience of how, I don't know, how that conflict has shaped our society or impacted us. I think when, when I mentioned that we have to decolonize our minds, you know, there's a lot, a lot of self-hatred within the Pakistani embodiment of the self. I find that the fact that Urdu is considered taboo is very much a representation of that because this idea there's a standard that we must fit into and that standard is very colonial very English and I think that creates that disconnect but also the children that are growing up under that kind of system as we know most people just well tend to accept what they're told very few question and when the very few question of course it takes time to make that difference when I was working on Hamoshi, it's called Hamoshi because of the silenced narratives. You know, I was just blown away that I didn't know all of this. And I was, you know, when I was in high school, we studied in history class, we talked about the British Empire and it was just tea is from India. <laughs> and that was it. That was the only mention of it. And I didn't think much about it. I just thought it was tea is from India. And then you are told to distance yourself from your culture because you feel as if if you appear ethnic, it means all the negative associations with that. And one of those things, which I highly regret now, where I am in my life now, I can't really speak Urdu fluently, nor can I write or read it. And I feel, I feel a sense of shame, I would say, but that it's just how can you access something when you're on the outside of it? And I think that's where my work begins anyway, on the outside of a cultural construct and trying to find a way in. But I think this is a common experience with many people. Yeah, that's very true. So you should be very lucky that you can write <laughs> and read English and Urdu. <laughs> Some of us are only kind of confined to one. <laughs> No, I agree with you that languages do open up access to a lot. But I think, yeah, I mean, this is probably a wider question to address at a wider community level. But I am interested in what you consume growing up that inspired you to continue to research Urdu literature and even Iqbal's poetry and how that has impacted you. You know, it's very interesting that despite not having access to it, there is an awareness. So is that, you know, a legacy within the family or was that entirely you? Fun facts would be that my dad named me after Bano Kutsiyev, so he liked some of her novels and he didn't tell me this actually until I turned 18 and I decided I wanted to be a writer. So one day he just said to me, well, you know, it makes sense now because you were named after a writer. <laughs> so that was kind of my, I was determined then to prove that but I'm a purposeful person. So I think, you know, I felt if I'm called, I'm named after a writer, I must be a writer. <laughs> It's in my bones. So yeah, I grew up reading a lot of English literature and English music and song lyrics and song helps you pick up rhythm and sound and I'd write my own lyrics. So I think I was very interested in that. And then at one point I got into photography. So I was hoping to mix the mediums together to have photographs and poetry and that. So I had no access to, you know, I didn't even watch Urdu film or Pakistani films or dramas and stuff of course it was there in the background so my elder siblings would watch it with my parents or something and I 
I was just in my own world. But my dad, when he realized that I wanted to write poetry, he recommended that I read some Urdu poets. And one of them, he recommended many, but when you are young, you don't listen. <laughs> that's, a, that's a common experience as well. So he recommended Iqbal's work, which was Secrets of the Self. And of course, because I couldn't I can understand bits of Urdu, so I understand the language. I just don't have a very good... Well, I can't speak it. So I found an English translation of Secrets of the Self. And at 18, 19 years old, you know, it just went over my head. <laughs> I, I read it and I just thought to myself, what is he talking about? <laughs> and put the book down. And then I started my degree in English and creative writing. That enabled me to think about the English literature practice and creative practice and modernism, postmodernism and experimental writing. So it was all great. But I think I kept questioning to myself, well, this is not me though. I can't see myself in this literature. It's great. It's exciting. It's learning about the French Revolution and the Romantic poets and, and all of that was fantastic. But where do I go from here? And I then had to return to Iqbal's work a bit later, I think. But that before that, I should mention, I went to Saudi Arabia for a holy pilgrimage and something happened. <laughs> Something it was just an experience which blew my mind because I came back from there. I wrote some poems and one of the poems that I wrote after that experience, which I don't really say this, but it, I didn't have to redraft it. You know, it was produced in the moment, which was called Shikwa. And that was the first poem where I felt I found my voice as a writer because I felt that I had a purpose and that purpose was to communicate the female experience and to voice the voiceless at that point, in which I will read that poem later at the end of this session, but that poem was just the opening for what was to come. And my supervisor said to me, you know, this could be published. So I, I think at that point I realized this is my voice. Now I need to develop this voice. So as I was going on, I decided that I was going to write my creative project, uh, which is equivalent to a dissertation in, for my master's hyphenated identity, the, the complexity surrounding having a two-part cultural identity. And I read Iqbal's poem called A Withered Rose. And the anguish in that poem, the loss um, that he communicates, I don't know, it just resonated with me. I felt, I mean, he was probably talking about something in a different context, but for me, it communicated that anguish of trying to find some way of existing between two different cultural constructs. And so that was kind of my cue to just go back and read Secrets of the Self again and try to understand where this poet is coming from, because maybe there is something there. And that was where I then found some connections. And I was interested in this higher self, the hoodie, which is spirited way of being in the world, having purpose. And I think the way he incorporated experience and Islamic history and working on Sufi ideas and building on that and being critical of them as well at the same time, I just found fascinating. But then, of course, you have to think about how can we as writers in this modern landscape use those ideas and bring them to a new audience? That's beautiful. Can I just say that I love hearing your thoughts on this and... On, on a little bit of a non-serious note, uh, I'm 38, I still don't fully understand those concepts. <laughs> well done. But yeah, I think I think what you said is beautiful, describing your whole experience of, you know, that spiritual journey and how that helped you get in touch with your own authentic voice. And I don't know if this is okay to say, but I find that with South Asian writers, particularly Muslim writers, but even with wider South Asian writers, spirituality is such a huge part of our identity. Mm -hmm. And our writing and our voice, and that's pretty absent from the wider conversation, as you know, I'm sure you you know a lot better than me. So yeah, I mean, I find it interesting that you found your voice. Like, have you found that, how have you found the receptivity to your authentic ideas in the wider audience in the UK? I think maybe, well, thinking about reviews of my work and just the general reception of it, I think, you know, it's maybe it's not the first thing that's looked at, which is understandable. I think as a culture, we have to grow and develop and these ideas will come maybe a bit later, but it's in the work already. My supervisor was just impressed by Muhammad Iqbal's work. He had never come across 
Iqbal's work or any other kinds of Islamic literature. And so I felt quite proud of myself that I had <laughs> introduced Iqbal to a different audience. And I think there is a lot of work going on at the moment in terms of translation with Iqbal's work, which is bringing his work to a new context as a, a South Asian thinker, an important thinker to the modern age. But I think that's going to take time. But that's what I mean. Sometimes with spirituality, you have to be quite sneaky with it. <laughs> yeah. You know, sneak it into your work. <laughs> it's all about. And, and, you know, another thing as well is sometimes readers don't know what they want until you present it to them. So as a writer, you should stay true to yourself. And I think sometimes that honesty and that approach communicates and you shouldn't worry too much about what does a readership want. You know, work on your own merits. And I think that's part of Iqbal's spirited sense of being in the world. You define who you are and you can choose how you present yourself. And you shouldn't feel ashamed or you shouldn't feel as if I need to slip into a different mold this time to sell myself because you should never sell yourself. You should be true to who you are. Yeah, I think that's beautifully described. I, I love <laughs> that. So yeah, thank you for that. So just in terms of you know, asking a little bit about your research, I'm conscious mm -hmm. that we've conversed a lot. Would you like to share a little bit of your poetry just to give context to the conversation that we've had so far and then more to your research? Yes, well, I can just briefly talk about my research, just a few lines, and then that will then allow the, the poetry to operate in its own space. My research is focused on the complexity surrounding the British Pakistani experience, which then enables me to critically analyze contemporary British Pakistani poets and the ways in which they are operating with their identity and selves throughout their own work, which is very different. So I think that's important. We should remember that although we share very core aspects of ourselves, uh, we are very different, we're individuals, and that should come through in our, in our creative work. And an interesting text that I read during Masters was a creative and critical pamphlet called Threads, which is co-written by writers Sandeep Pama, Anisha Ramaya, and Bana Kapil. And the text discusses the limitations of the lyric in British poetry, the simplifying of our identities to a suit a certain readership, and of course, returning to the sorrow and trauma involved in the partition and the female experience. So in this text, there's a mention of the fourth space, which is highly theoretical, but this fourth space is where the binaries of self and other. So just to give context, self and other might be Self might be your British sense of self, which is probably more accepted than your Pakistani self, which is othered. So it's about rising above these binaries and not refusing to stay in these fixed positions, which are harmful in every way we can think of. And in Threads, there is an email exchange between Sandeep Pama and Banu Kapil, where it begins to embody this fourth space. So I would recommend if you wanted to see how this fourth space operates, how it works, to read that section in the book. And how I'm coming to think about the fourth space is building on the concept of Iqbal's hoodie and also looking at Hubert Herman's theory of the dialogical self, which means that we have multiple selves and we have a society of, in our minds. If that's not clear, I mean, <laughs> I hope that's clear, but, you know, we are not just singular beings. And I think we should come to embrace that. Yeah. And I, I should also mention as well that we are complex and quite imperfect, which means that this higher self might not be accessible, but we can try to search for it. And we just have to constantly decolonize our minds, remove all the toxic elements that we might have within our community, our ideas, within our culture about whether that's about masculinity and femininity and how it should be. And these are the ways forward. So now I will read <laughs> some poetry. I'm just thinking, I don't want to give too much context. I'll read Shikwa from Hamoshi first. This was based on an entire generation of women. So I was thinking more about my grandmother and who are very strong women. But if we were to view them from a, a Western gaze of feminism, they seem very silent and submissive. So this was my attempt to address that. Shikwa. 
shut the day out and absorb the music. Women crushing chilies in their fist, fueling the fire. I said, listen, as they lead the bulls across to plow the paddy field. My grandma is one of the women. Shut the day out and absorb the music. Flustered red hot children cry as the women walk. Baskets balanced on the head, full of chapatis to feed the men. My grandma is one of the women. Shut the day out and absorb the music of the colourless compromise, where the women are told men only fertilise the soil and them. Shut the day out and absorb their stare. The eyes sing shattered songs that lose their range when far from home. My grandma is one of the women. Sats Shikwa. For my recent, the new sequence that I'm working on, I started to research and focus on the Indian Rebellion of 1857. And of course, it's known in various ways, Sepoy Uprising, Sepoy Rebellion, and its controversial name, the Sepoy Mutiny. And whilst I was researching about the Indian Rebellion, I came across the story of a certain Sepoy named Alan Begg, whose skull was kept as a trophy and discovered in Mr. and Mr. Mrs. Mantle's pub in Warmer Kent. And the trophy skull was then handed over to historian Kim A. Wagner, who tried to piece together the life of Begg and to find some way to pay homage to the man himself. The only historical narrative that includes some information about who Begg is, is a note found in one of his eye sockets. Yes, it's it's very um, gruesome, which determines that Berg is a rebel who had violated British civilians. Although this narration might be true, it doesn't offer a full picture of who Alan Berg was and under what circumstances he was operating in. And I actually came across the trophy skull of Berg in an article exploring the photos of the Abu Ghraib incident, where the violence depicted is unexplainable and at times it's unthinkable. So naturally, as a writer, I felt compelled to examine and write about this trophy skull and the cruelty associated with it. So I'm going to read two poems from the sequence, and then I think that's all I can (laughs) offer today. (laughs) The voices are enclosed in the eye of the well. I lower the knotted rope, the darkness churns. It is here the shadows appear amongst the bare bones of buildings. This forgotten scape crushed by constant killing. At the core of the gunpowder, the shells, the fumes of buildings, the letters of revolt, the signals are the dead. I heard the voices wandering the wave in search for the one who seeks and there a vision was conceived. Turn inward to see the first light of day through the leaves of a loat tree. I grip the rope and pull. The executions erased the threat, the struggle and stories of these sepoys, scattered in nameless pieces. To believe in the oneness of experience is to simplify the tensions of history. The voice rises from the well. I didn't know where I was coming from until I arrived. I raise the water-filled bucket. What do I need to know? I, an enactment of violence, a historical silence. Across the well, I see his hands rest on the stone, white trousers, a red coat, a code attached to the front, three stripes on shoulder. He has a name, Alan Begg. I didn't know where I was coming from until I arrived, thinking of, in it. Before Begg's teeth were sinking in Mrs. Mantle's palm, before he became a national spectacle of colonial cruelty versus Victorian victory, 
he was a man. And so was every sepoy before he became an ashtray. I follow the red-coated figure down to his chamber. Where have I arrived? The bugle sounds. He wakes an instructor of the school of musketry. He will return in chains, within him an unmappable wilderness. These self-restrained hillmen, like the tigers of their own jungles, are locked in the British imagination. They refused the percussion caps for their muskets. The torched buildings like secret notes. They witnessed the fang of the flame, Pandy's roped neck. Half charge of gunpowder, a heavy barrel. I let go of the rope and watch the bucket fall. Nothing ever begins. Everything contained floats to the forefront of the wave. Families, honor, status, hair, skin, tongue, bloody neck. These thugs thirst for European blood. Fire, fragments materialize in the air. A spine, legs with coiled skin, bodies in eternal unrest. Begs arms and legs tied to the wheel of the gun under the sun. How many fibers are twisted to create the rope? Fire. Beg holds his breath. Thank you. I'm very touched that you shared your beautiful poetry with us and also your thoughts and the context around it. And I think both of them were brilliant in their own right, capturing the female experience as well as identity and everything related to that. But also this one and the way you talk about, I forget the exact words, but how if the oneness of history would erase the truth something to that effect it was beautifully told so thank you i'm sure some of you can offer better words than i have been able to at this point yes i'd like to add something the first one about the female identity i guess you'd find pretty much anyone and everyone contributing to that but the 1857 like i remember reading a book which was called the 1857 ki jange azadi as opposed to the mutiny so the argument the author had was that it's called the mutiny while it was not. There's mm-hmm. the other story where because of all that was happening, that was being done to the people of India, they were forced to stand up and fight for their rights. So I guess that story, very few people would tell and you doing that is definitely a great service. And you're in a good position to be able to balance that. If I were to do that, I would probably go all guns blazing and say, I mean, you dash dash Brits, you did this to us and you know, Payback time, you can't stop me from saying this, so I probably will. But you could probably balance that, definitely balance that and give something that would leave an impact to a reader on both sides of the divide. So Mm -hmm. I think it's an excellent, excellent effort that you're making. Done it very well. Thank you. (laughs) Well, I look forward to hearing you read. I guess I'm getting to realize that it's more of show than tell. I'm more of of someone who would tell what's happening rather than show. So I guess I've not gotten to that. So you, it will be a very basic thing for someone who has gone, who has reached the, you know, the point of. Oh, being no, 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 no. I mean, it, this is a space. Um, I think just a point that's just come to me that I, I think I've not mentioned. Authenticity. We should also question what that means. We should question, you know, we have in our minds, we have a set standard or we think that this is who we are, but we just question everything. So feel free to read your work. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Should I go ahead or would anyone yeah, like to? So I'll give the background later once I've recited the whole thing. Oh, The year, some say, was 65, while others don't fix. Around the dinner table sat a set of greatest six. Contemporary rulers of the world then known, for the longest each would occupy their throne. All praise be to Allah, said Akbar, quenching his thirst. Allah who Akbar? asked Queen Elizabeth I. Yes, Allah who Akbar? Allah the greatest. Ask Ivan, Philip, thy mask or any statist. Chimed, however, this band of leaders, Allah who chanted the magnificent Suleiman, Allah who, Allah who, Allah who. Then to, and to amuse her some quarter century later, the son of this farmer, this night's unassuming waiter, William, had he been there to make it odd, 
would have summed this with his verse on the Lord. Now God be praised that to believing souls gives light in darkness, comfort in despair. While I resort to quoting him, my mind consoles. You're ending your poem on Shakespeare. So, well, it is kind of like an imaginary setting. The year is 1665 or 66, when all the greatest leaders of the world were alive, who had served the longest reigns, the Queen Elizabeth, Suleiman the Magnificent, and all these other, I think the six of them were there. So it's a conversation in which I just wanted to introduce the concept of God to them, of Allah, rather than just God. So this is why I used the Allah and the who, and then Akbar was answering and then Queen and the conversation taking place. And incidentally, Shakespeare was there at that time. He was just two years old. So and he would, they say, met the Queen some quarter century later and performed one of his plays in front of her. So this is a verse taken by him from one of his poems and which talks about God and his uh, greatness. So I just tried to put all that together in a setting, a fic fictional setting, and that's what it was all about. To me, I, I quite liked the comical side to it as well. I don't know if that was intended. The back and forth of Allahu going on? Yeah, well, the rhythm, of course, but then no, the kind of, I mean, maybe that's just, I think, the, the fun nature to it. Well, it's... So is that intended? Yeah, it is. It is sort of a back and forth of where you're trying to frustrate the listeners. And, you know, like I'm saying, I'm trying to emphasize something and putting it there while it does not belong there at all. Mm. So it is sort of to frustrate the, the listener or the audience. Well, then I think it's the apt ending. It's perfect, the ending where it ends on Shakespeare. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's thinking like, about that theme and then ending on Shakespeare. It's <laughs> like me telling myself that I am uh, resorting to quoting and putting an end to my verse on Shakespeare. So it's kind of like a self-conversation as well. That's interesting. Thank you. I'd also like to see it physically, sure. like the visual format. Okay, yeah, I could, I could, I don't know how I could share that right now. No, no, I mean, I think that's just a question. <laughs> this okay. is me speaking in my Well, actually, when I, when I did put it up on a picture, like you mentioned that you got into photography and putting pictures and yes. work together, that's how... I uh, restarted writing poetry was when I saw a friend of mine doing the same. And I mm -hmm. felt that I could also do that because a lot of times a picture adds a mo more of a perspective than you could add just from the text alone. Or even the picture could not signify as much. So that uh -huh. is how I have pretty much put all my poems. And this one, when I put it up, I put it with a picture of Nostradamus, who mm -hmm. was also incidentally alive at that time. So it was just a... Of, no, it, uh, it's yeah. very nice to have the visual and I think because of the social media as well and the visual formatting of how we perceive the world as well it's a great idea but I should also mention that there are smaller presses as well where you can send your work yeah. through that are looking for new voices okay so um, I would love to hear of such because I, I explored every every avenue over here locally and mm -hmm. except for print on demand there's no other option left I've, I've reached out to everyone over here so mm -hmm. They are not really interested in doing that. So, well, maybe... I'll where where are you based? In Karachi. So, so <laughs> no I'm not it. entirely sure. <laughs> I was told that there are some presses in US, in India, small, smaller presses, uh, or in UK perhaps, which do look at such uh, unique or, well, strange voices. <laughs> so, yes, no, no, I think that, that, yeah. I think you'd have to check on the submissions page. The one that is in my head, I think, because of the, the reference of the Lotre, the Lotre Press, I don't know if that's based in the UK and if they do take submissions from. Okay, sure. I look those up. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your poem. Yes, welcome. Really enjoyed it. It's a really interesting poem, Nader. And one of the things I was thinking in context to, because I've heard this one before, so I allowed my mind to wander a bit to the conversation that both of you had prior to you sharing it. And to Kutsia's point, I feel like Exploring your authenticity is important, but also the cultural context to everything is really important. So different cultures have consumed different kinds of material and what you share and what you consume with each other kind of shapes your future creative outputs. I think because of that, there would always be differences in how people express themselves. And I think that's probably what makes it unique as well. Yeah. In the meantime, I will talk a little bit to a few of the, of the points that you raised earlier, Kutsia, and that is 
And I feel like there were a lot of important things that you touched upon during our conversation about the community. We spoke about it being fragmented. It's very interesting that your collection is called Hamushi because I feel not only is there a silence around our literary narrative, it is also that we're, I find, and I was raised in Pakistan, that culturally there is a tendency to shut out a lot of feelings, a lot of conversations. So immigration trauma is not talked about. So I do think that so much of this is cultural, but the work that you're doing is incredibly important, both from our community's point of view, as well as for the wider community to start hearing our narrative and start accepting that we have different and authentic voices, but they're equally valid. Part of the reason why there is less acceptance, I feel, is because there's not enough being done at a community level. You know, you're doing it as an individual and there are all of the other poets I know are much older. They're an older generation even from me. And so I do think that there is a massive gap that needs to be addressed. So thank you for doing the work. But it's also a heads up that I may be in touch with you for more (laughs) things that we're planning to do. Oh, no, I think it's important. And I think my parents were the same when I was talking about female experiences as if, you know, it's very, I think it's very hard as a Pakistani woman to stand up and speak up against the toxic. I mean, there there are some narratives that we inherit surrounding the female, which once you start to question them, you start to think to yourself, you know, where does this come from? And (laughs) it's illogical. And I think that's something that I'm interested in working with the myth of the Jurel as well, you know, distorting the way that we view her. And often that word is used to describe any woman who might not fit the nice neat box that we have set for, (laughs) you know, womanhood. So you have to sometimes speak up and it might not make everybody happy, but someone's got to do it. Right. And I think when you start doing it, when more people start to hear your voice, that's when others get the courage to tell their stories authentically as well. So yeah, that is really important. I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm so sad that it's time bound. You know, like I mentioned before, feeling very much on the edge and alone with this entire experience. It's now now nice to see it. Actually, there was a community. I just wasn't fully aware of it. So thank you. For, for all that you, you've done and still are continuing to do. But that's so heartwarming to hear. I wanted to say that earlier as well. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for reaching out. You know, if you didn't reach out, we wouldn't be here. So, <laughs> well, I, I'm really glad we connected and thank you for doing the work you are and for everything, for, you know, keeping the voice alive and for researching all of these really important but ignored subjects. And I would say that I'm sorry that there's been no community support. I think this is such, it's a tragedy with Pakistanis, you know, whether we're talking about things back home or with international Pakistanis, there isn't community support. And so when I see somebody still doing something for the community and keeping that identity and voice alive, I I can only imagine the strength it's taken, right? So... Seriously, I admire that a lot and we'll continue to be in touch. Yes, thank you.